All right, let's get started with our case. We have a 27-year-old female who's presented with dysmenorrhea and dyspareunia. Now, looking at the non-contrast pelvic MRI, the first thing that catches my eye is a well-circumscribed septated left adnexal mass adjacent to the uterus and surrounded by ovarian tissue. This mass is hyperintense on the T1-weighted sequence and, importantly, it doesn't suppress on fat saturation images. That's a key feature to note. The mass is causing some mass effect, mildly displacing the uterus to the right, but there's no free fluid in the pelvis and the lesion appears solitary. Based on these imaging features, my leading diagnosis is a right-sided endometrioma. Let's move on to diagnosis. In a patient of this age, we need to consider a few possibilities. First, we have a hemorrhagic cyst, which can also present as a solitary, high T1-weighted signal ovarian mass. However, in the case of a hemorrhagic cyst, the high T1 signal typically doesn't persist, as it should resolve with time. Another important differential is an ovarian dermoid. Dermoids can have a high T1-weighted signal as well, but the critical point is that this high signal will suppress on fat-saturated sequences, which is not what we're seeing here. So that's less likely in this case. Other differentials include an ovarian neoplasm, where we would expect to see enhancing nodules or peritoneal deposits on imaging. This could suggest a more aggressive pathology, but again, we don't have those findings here. Finally, a tubo-ovarian abscess should be on the list, particularly if there's a history of infection. In such cases, you might see stranding of the adjacent soft tissues, which can help differentiate it from an endometrioma. But that's not the scenario we're dealing with in this patient. Now let's shift gears a bit and talk about endometriosis itself. This condition involves the presence of functional endometrial tissue outside the endometrium and myometrium, most commonly affecting women of reproductive age. Endometriosis can even show up in teenagers and, in rare cases, in postmenopausal women, around 5% of cases. The symptoms tend to be cyclical, driven by hormonal changes, and they often improve with pregnancy or postmenopause. Classic presentations include dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, pelvic pain, and infertility. In fact, up to 50% of patients with endometriosis experience some degree of subfertility. What's particularly interesting about endometriosis is that the implants can occur anywhere within the peritoneal cavity. They may even deposit on the bowel serosa, leading to cyclical rectal bleeding. Endometriosis can encompass endometrial deposits, adhesions, or endometriomas, as we're seeing in this case. These chocolate cysts are filled with blood products, tend to recur, and don't have a true epithelial lining. They're formed by invagination of the ovarian cortex. Other potential sites of endometriosis involvement include the uterosacral ligaments, the posterior broad ligament, the pouch of Douglas, the rectosigmoid, the urinary tract, most commonly the bladder, and even scar tissue. Distant sites, though rare, have been reported, such as deposits in the lungs or central nervous system. For imaging, the initial investigation is usually ultrasound. Endometriomas on ultrasound can present in various forms from simple anechoic cysts to more complex low-level echoic cysts. They might be unilocular or multilocular, with thin or thick septations, and sometimes they display a fluid-fluid level. There's typically no intracystic Doppler signal, but a paralesional Doppler signal may be seen. The absence of an intracystic signal can help differentiate a complex solid-appearing lesion from malignancy, though it's not definitive for endometriosis. On MRI, as we see in this case, endometriomas typically appear as homogeneously hyperintense lesions on T1-weighted sequences, and importantly, they do not suppress with fat saturation. On T2-weighted images, endometriomas show variable signals from intermediate to high. We also often see layering of blood products, creating a fluid-fluid level and a peripheral rim of low T2-weighted signal caused by chronic blood products. Post contrast, there might be peripheral enhancement of the fibrous wall, though the intracystic contents do not enhance. A classic feature on MRI is the kissing ovaries sign, where the ovaries are drawn together due to adhesions. This is something we clearly observe in this patient's images, and it's a hallmark of more advanced endometriosis. Endometriotic deposits, or plaques, are another important imaging feature. These appear as intermediate signal intensity masses, 
with areas of high T1-weighted and low T2-weighted signal. In this case, there's a notable peritoneal plaque visible on the T2-weighted sequence, extending from the dorsal aspect of the uterine body to the anterior surface of the sigmoid colon. There's also the typical tethering of the bowel and layering of the ovarian endometrioma, which are hallmark signs. Ultimately, the gold standard for diagnosing endometriosis remains laparoscopy. During laparoscopy, endometriotic deposits can be seen as blue-brown, red, or black stains, with nodules and scarring often present. For management, we typically refer patients to a gynecologist. Symptoms can be controlled with GnRH therapy, and for patients concerned with fertility, laparoscopic resection is an option. So in summary, this case is a classic example of endometriosis presenting as a right-sided endometrioma. The MRI findings, particularly the hyperintensity on T1-weighted images and lack of fat suppression, are classic for this diagnosis. I hope this case discussion has been helpful in highlighting the key radiological features of endometriomas and deepening your understanding of endometriosis as a condition. For more case discussions like this one, don't forget to subscribe to Radiology Made Easy and leave a comment with your thoughts below.